All right, so I want to uh, I want to uh, dive in and preach a an expository lesson on Daniel seven today. Um, and can everybody see that cool looking monster there in my first slide? All right. Um, so I want to talk about Daniel chapter seven. Um, I know that you know across the country today, uh, people are um, virtually not in person um, because of uh, you know the plague that's come upon us. Uh, but people are coming into uh, uh, worship services uh, online, and many of them are uh, hearing messages about uh, Christ being raised from the dead just because of uh, what day it is. Um, and while that's very important and that's, uh, that's a good thing to think on and, uh, and that's a, another lesson for another day, I want to talk uh, uh, about Daniel 7 today because I think it lays such an important groundwork uh, for the kingdom uh, and it so lays such an important groundwork for understanding the significance of uh, Christ's sacrifice and Christ's resurrection. Um, so I want to spend some time in Daniel today. Um, it's, uh, it's a lesson that I think, uh, you know, prophecy generally, I think we tend to uh, avoid because we can get a little bit scared of it. Uh, so I want to kind of uh, demystify and dispel uh, any notions of fear around books like Daniel or other prophetic books. Uh, these are some of the, the strongest uh, undergirding pieces uh, uh, of the Old Testament that, that, that hold up our faith uh, and point to the coming Christ. Um, so before we talk about Daniel 7, I want to talk for uh, just a second about a, a part of Daniel chapter 2. Uh, so turn with me back to Daniel chapter 2 for just a minute, starting in verse 31. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 31 through verse 45. Starting in verse 31, Daniel says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom, God, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom, inferior to you, shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so that the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Um, I want to focus on this because I think we see a few important things in Daniel that we don't see um, clearly anywhere else in the Bible. 
Uh, for example, I mean, the Messiah, uh, the coming Messiah is promised in a number of, of, of passages of prophecy. Um, it, there are many kingdom prophecies that tell that there will be a, a Messiah coming. But nowhere do we see the historic elements so clearly as Daniel. Uh, the prophecies are so clear uh, that for years it's been in the best interest of many to uh, try to muddle them uh, or to write them off as later forgeries. Um, but historians almost universally attest to the fact that the book of Daniel was considered scripture by the Jews by the time of the Greeks. Um, so if this book is a forgery, it would have had to have been, it would have had to have appeared at the same time. And the odds of it gaining broad acceptance in such a short period of time are overwhelmingly slim. Uh, all the evidence, to my mind, points to uh, the book of Daniel being written when it says it was written uh, during the days of the late Babylonian Empire and early Persian Empire. So this gives us some keys to interpreting Daniel chapter 2. Um, Daniel, in interpreting the king's uh, dream through the power of God, Daniel's going to lay out roughly 500 years of history uh, for the king, uh, 500 years of, of history to come. Uh, it would have been uh, 500 years of the future for them, 500 years of history as we now look back on it. And this was a time when nation states were, were increasing in their size. So the Babylonian empire that Daniel lived under was considered enormous and powerful and frightful. Uh, it's the head of gold in the dream, right? But another big kingdom is going to come, and uh, it's chest, uh, and, uh, you know, the chest and the arms of silver of this statue, and that's going to be the Persian empire. Uh, and after them, a bronze empire will rule the world. This is Greece. And then finally after that, a greater still kingdom, Rome, will rule the world partly strong and partly brittle. And in the days of that kingdom, Daniel says, God will establish a kingdom that would be like a mountain filling the whole earth. And that mountain is our faith. But also in this prophecy, we see the exact time of the coming of the Messiah, or at least a time frame. Uh, so we can even see a glimpse of the kingdom's uh, scope, the idea that it'll fill the whole world. Okay, so I like Daniel 2 because there is some overlap between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 in terms of the meaning uh, and the nations. So now that we understand that, let's dive into Daniel 7. I think it'll be a little bit easier for us for, to understand. Let's read Daniel 7 in its entirety. Daniel 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had, eagle, and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And, I was, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this thorn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, his clothing as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A steam of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, 
And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head armed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped out all that was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, that seemed greater than, his, than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed in the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of his kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter hid in my heart. Okay, so Daniel has a dream, and he sees in his dream a series of beasts. And again, much like the vision that Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 2, each one of these beasts, just like each section of the statue in Daniel chapter 2, each one of these beasts represents a kingdom. Um, and it's actually the same four kingdoms that we see in Daniel chapter 2. Um, so here, uh, most of my PowerPoint today is going to be just uh, presenting to you some cool artistic interpretations of some of these beasts just to get you a better idea. Um, but we see uh, four beasts, and each one of these beasts corresponds with a different kingdom. First, we have, uh, we have four kingdoms, the Babylonian uh, the Persian, Greek, and Roman, and again, these correspond with those kingdoms in Daniel 2. In the, in the, the first beast, we have this lion with wings, uh, and it is a, a representation of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, in the second beast, we have, uh, you know, uh, this great giant bear with, with, with uh, 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 fangs uh, in its mouth. Uh, the, 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 this is the Persian Empire. We have a, a third beast that represents the Greek Empire, a four-headed, uh, you know, lion with wings uh, that is uh, given dominion for a time. And then finally, we have the terrible fourth beast, which is unlike any of the rest uh, and has ten horns. And you'll notice that the first three beasts are described in terms of um, animals that human beings can understand, right? Lion, bear, leopard. Uh, the fourth beast is, isn't it described in terms of any animals that you can recognize. It almost sounds completely alien. Uh, and so this is what Daniel means when he says it's different from all the rest. It's strange 
or it's foreign. Uh, he doesn't really attempt to even describe it in terms of human animals or animals that humans are familiar with. And he's particularly concerned about uh, this fourth beast, uh, this one uh, represent that we know now, looking back, represents the Roman Empire, although Daniel didn't know that. Um, he can tell that the beast, this fourth beast, is key to this whole thing. Uh, but there are some notable features about the the, the beast that, uh, that that make it distinctive. One, it's it's terrifying. It's exceedingly strong. Um, it has iron teeth, uh, and it has uh, ten horns. And, and iron is significant in that it's um, basically the strongest thing that ancient people could think of. Right? It's the unbreakable metal to their minds. Uh, and so the idea that that this beast has iron teeth and that it tramples underfoot everything that it encounters, uh, and that this is to be interpreted as a metaphor for a great and mighty kingdom uh, that is coming in the future, it's no wonder that would have been terrifying to Daniel, because he's living under the first of these kingdoms, uh, which he already finds uh, terrifying and strong, and he's being asked to imagine kingdoms that are coming that are going to get increasingly fearful and dreadful in terms of their military might, in terms of their strength, uh, and size. Uh, so Daniel is, uh, you know, concerned about this fourth beast. Uh, and then, you know, you have this strange little bit of a, of a horn popping up that takes dominion over, uh, over the other horns and three of the other horns, uh, uh, are cast out, uh, by it. And Daniel can't really figure that out. And, and neither can I really, to be honest with you, I've read some stuff and there are theories out there, but I, I don't really care to get into it in this sermon. But but what we can say is uh, that uh, um, this this beast is is to be uh, unlike any anything else that the ancient world has seen, um, and so without getting too bogged down in the in the minutia of the symbolism of this fourth beast, I want to talk about what I think is more important, which is this section that starts with the discussion of the ancient of days, right? What did that mean to the audience uh, that it was written to? Uh, well, you know, to Jews, when, when, we, when the term ancient of days is used, uh, the ancient, ancient of days is God, but uh, we can assume that that's its meaning, but, but it has a more specific meaning. It, it, it has, it's the idea of God as one who precedes time, right? God who uh, was there before the garden, before creation. Uh, so this picture of the Ancient of Days has God seated on his throne in glory. This is a heavenly uh, scene that's being painted, and it emphasizes God's timelessness, right? That God exists outside of and before time. So the Ancient of Days comes, and he sits on this great glorious throne of flame, and he's arrayed in white, and there's a multitude with him. We're told a thousand serve him, and ten thousand uh, ten thousand stand before him, and God sits in judgment. Uh, of all four of these kingdoms, and it's significant that we're told that the fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, we know now looking back on it, will be destroyed completely and die, essentially, while the other kingdoms, uh, their dominion will be taken away, but they will be allowed to live on for an appointed time, right? Uh, and if you look at the historical record, um, that's true. I mean, when Rome fell, uh, it never rose again. I mean, there is a city of Rome now, obviously, uh, but 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 the Rome that conquered the world wasn't so much the city as it was the bureaucracy of that city government that expanded and grew and grew and grew to take over more and more uh, territory. When that when that bureaucracy, when that government fell, it would never rise again. Um, there was never again to be a nation of Rome after after it fell, uh, although many other nations tried to claim the name. You know, it, Italy wasn't a country at this time. Everything was organized behind the city of Rome. Uh, so uh, the other countries, Greece, Persia, Babylon, um, well, where's Greece on a map? Uh, the same place it was then, right, more or less. Uh, and the other nations, you know, that were known as Persia and Babylon, then, you know, they never really ceased to be. They just sort of changed and took on new names we call them Iran and Iraq now, uh, instead of Persia and Babylon. Um, but Rome would never again exert anything like the power that it had in its empire. Um, 
so Daniel's concerned about the dream and he goes to a friend uh, and the friend tells him the meaning of the dream in short. He says, don't worry about it. God will judge and God's people will win. That's basically the summation uh, uh, of the dream uh, in chapter in chapter seven, verse 18. But the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Um, but Daniel wants some specific things about the beast interpreted. So the friend gives him that as well. Uh, he says that the fourth kingdom will be unlike anything that's ever been seen before. There will be somehow in this, uh, in this period where, uh, the son of man comes, there will be 10 Kings. Uh, and the last King will push aside three others. Um, he will be against the people of God. He will persecute them for a given time. He will be destroyed in the end. These are some specifics that, that, uh, that Daniel has given. Um, and at the end of the chapter, it seems that Daniel's still troubled. Daniel still completely doesn't understand. Um, and that's all right, because if we're being honest, this vision was given for, for us uh, to understand, not necessarily for Daniel to completely understand. And I'll get into what I mean by that in just a minute. Um, but the last thing that, that, that is established in this passage that I think is significant is this idea that in this vision, uh, Daniel sees that it's during this time, during the time of this fourth beast, this fourth kingdom, that, that one like a son of man will be given dominion. And, and this is uh, the section at the end uh, of chapter seven, uh, or rather, sorry, from, from 13, 13 and 14, uh, is one like a son of man and in 14 and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting domain, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So an everlasting dominion, and a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Uh, there, there is a sense in which there may have been many earthly kingdoms uh, since Rome, but there's also a sense in which all those kingdoms have existed under the shadow of a new great spiritual kingdom, um, one which calls to all the nations of the world, uh, one the, the, the kingdom under which uh, we, we all are members and to which the Son of Man has been given dominion. So, what can we take away? What are some applications for us from this? Well, one, we can understand that the time, place, and scope of the kingdom was prophesied centuries before the fact. I want us to remember that the prophecies contained in the book of Daniel uh, were, were written uh, roughly uh, some 500 years, uh, more than 500 years, uh, before uh, the the events that it describes of the Roman Empire and the coming of the Son of Man, uh, so so before that, through through divine providence and through revelation, the time, place, and scope of the kingdom was prophesied. The Bible calls its own shot, essentially, um, and uh, that that that's an incredible thing. Not only calls its own shot, but calls its own shot, you know, a, a half a millennia before the fact. Another thing we can take away is that God is in control of the times and places and powers of this world and that they serve him and not the other way around. Um, and that's something that I find comforting, especially, especially during this time when everything seems so unstable. Um, this is all part of a greater plan. And even if we never understand uh, what, part, what, what every part of that plan is, the God we serve, the, the God of creation, uh, and the same God who gave visions to Daniel and moved uh, uh, and manipulated and and uh, ordered the kingdoms to his purpose during this time, that same God is still in control today. Thirdly, you know, Jesus is the force that came and broke apart the kingdoms of this world. He is that rock uh, not cut out by any human hand that smashes the statue. Uh, in Daniel chapter two, uh, and scatters the bits of it to to the wind. Um, of course, kingdoms have gone on, governments have gone on since the time of Christ. 
But Christ has changed the game forever. Christ has brought about a spiritual kingdom, uh, which, which has spread throughout the whole world and has never stopped growing since the time of his coming. His kingdom uh, continues uh, to find new expansions of its borders, even during a time like this when we can't physically meet together. Um, if you don't believe that Jesus is a game changer, uh, think about uh, the way that history has gone. History, if you want to look at it cynically, is just a series of warring tribes beating each other up. Um, and uh, during the time that Daniel prophesied during, it was a, a, like I said, a time of growing nation states. The Babylonian Empire, when they came and conquered Jerusalem, were the most frightful, terrifying army uh, that the Jews had ever seen. But in a few hundred years, the Persian army were more terrifying than them. And then a few hundred years after that came the Greeks. And finally, the Romans, which would have blown, uh, you know, the minds of people uh, during the Babylonian times to see an army like that. Um, and really what Jesus says when he comes to earth during the time of that Roman empire is these physical things, war, possessions, materialism, they're not what, what we're after. There is a spiritual kingdom. There is a kingdom beyond this and a life beyond this. And that idea, that very strange idea, has never died, has never gone away. And in fact, it's grown. It's grown like, uh, like wildfire in the 2,000 years since. So Jesus was that force that came and broke apart the kingdoms of the world, changed the game forever. And Jesus ushered in a kingdom of which we are citizens and a kingdom that calls to the whole world, not just a specific group. The chosen people of God aren't just a small tribe, uh, you know, in the Middle East now. The chosen people of God are people of all nations everywhere. Uh, and this is, this is what's meant in Daniel chapter 2 when it says it's a mountain that will fill up the whole earth. Uh, and, it, and in Daniel chapter 7, it's even more explicit than that. It says that all the nations and languages of the world will come to him. And finally, we are a part of an unshakable kingdom, a kingdom whose victory is already written. This kingdom uh, will not be taken away, will not be moved. We're told this uh, here in Daniel chapter 7, uh, that, that the kingdom, the, the, the dominion, the power given to Christ will not pass away and his kingdom will not be destroyed. We live in the, only, in the only kingdom the world has ever known that needs no walls or fortifications or defenses. It is sure, and it will last until uh, the Lord returns. So, with that said, let's remember that the things that were written before the coming of Christ were written for our learning, uh, were written to give us hope, and in a lot of cases, were written to help people understand the coming sacrifice of Christ, help them understand the coming kingdom, and it can help us understand those things as well. It's a great kingdom that we are a part of, and this is normally the time when I would transition into uh, offering an invitation to ask you to, to join that kingdom if you haven't yet. Um, it's a little difficult to offer an invitation in the traditional way now, but I will say that God's invitation stands open. It, it, it's open every day, always, forever, uh, until he returns. And um, God wants everyone to be part of his kingdom. God wants everyone to accept his rule over them. Uh, and, and it's a benevolent rule. It, it is a rule that wants what's best for us. It's not a tyrannical rule. Um, and it's a rule that comes through the blood of Christ, through an atoning sacrifice that can actually offer forgiveness of sins, if, if one will only accept. So with that being said, I know that the elders here would, uh, would be happy to hear from anybody who is in need spiritually. Um, and uh, so if, if you have needs, please, don't hesitate to make them known. If you want to be a Christian, certainly don't hesitate to make that known to the leadership of your congregation. I want to go ahead and, and, and thank the elders and, and all of you for having me speak for you. Um, 
in times like these, I know it's difficult. I know that as, as amazing as technology is, I know that a Zoom conference isn't the same as sitting in the pews with your fellow Christians, singing praises together, hearing each other's voices. But let's remember that we are part of a very big kingdom. It's a kingdom with a long history, and it's a kingdom that's been in the works uh, for longer than anything that we can remember. We are a part of something that moves across centuries of time. And even when there are blips like this in, uh, in our history, we continue on. We serve a great God, and we are a part of the greatest kingdom that the world has ever seen. Thank you for your kind attention.